T minus 10, 9, 8, go for maintenance to start, 7, 6. On February 7, 2008, three, Space Shuttle Atlantis launched STS-122, the 121st Space Shuttle flight and the 24th shuttle mission to the International Space Station. The primary objective of STS-122 was to deliver the European Columbus Science Laboratory, built by the European Space Agency, to the International Space Station. Taking aim on the International Space Station for docking on Saturday. 28 seconds into the flight, the three liquid fuel main engines soon will throttle back to 72% of rated performance, going in the bucket, reducing the stress on the shuttle as it breaks through the sound barrier. Atlantis, three miles in altitude, seven miles downrange. 50 seconds into the flight, the engine's beginning to throttle back up, standing by for that call from Capcom Jim Dutton. Atlantis, go and throttle up. Atlantis copies, go and throttle up. The throttle up call acknowledged by Commander Steve Frick, joined on the flight deck by pilot Alan Poindexter, Rex Walheim, and Leland Melvin. Seated down on the mid deck are Stan Love and Hans Schlegel and Leopold Ayarts of the European Space Agency. Ayarts hitching a ride to his new home on the International Space Station. One minute, 30 seconds into the flight, Atlantis already 15 miles in altitude, 16 miles downrange from the Kennedy Space Center, traveling 2,000 miles an hour. Three good main engines, three good fuel cells, three auxiliary power units, all functioning normally. Standing by for solid rocket booster separation. After just two minutes, we've used up the solid rocket boosters. We uh, jettisoned them. Then here's a great view of Atlantis from that camera off that solid rocket booster pushing away. A minute or so later, we're up to about 10,000 miles an hour. We roll heads up, and you have a view of the Atlantic there in the background as we go up the east coast of the United States. Eight and a half minutes, and uh, we've gotten to the speed we need. We shut down the engines and jettison the external tank. Uh, you'll see it come off here in just a second, and the reaction control jets on the orbiter push us away and uh, get us safely clear. We do a small burn and uh, push out in front so we can get some pictures of it. Uh, the glow you see is actually just the plasma around the orbiter since we're going 17,000 miles an hour and we're still in just a little bit of the atmosphere here as we climb away. After reaching orbit, a majority of the activity was devoted to inspecting the shuttle's thermal protection system using the orbital boom sensor system. Which we're gonna use on flight day two, the first full day in orbit, to grapple an inspection boom that we carried up on the side of the payload bay. And with it, we're going to scan all of the areas of the orbiter that see high temperatures on entry to make sure that the heat shield didn't sustain any damage. That's a sped up view of uh, the boom maneuvering. This is a view out of one of the sensors on the end of that inspection boom as we sweep it across the orbiter, looking to make sure we didn't sustain any damage during launch. And there's a view out that camera looking at Hans, who's looking out the hatch window. On February 9th, 2008, Atlantis slowly approached the station, performed its pitch over inspection maneuver, and then docked with the International Space Station. Steve's at the controls here, and once this is complete, we fly out in front of the station, down to, out to a distance of about 300 feet, and come down the velocity vector of the space station. This is a view of the uh, space station rising, and the closure rate that we actually see in a moment here, we'll speed this up, and you can see the docking systems coming together. Steve is controlling the uh, orbiter to a tolerance of about three inches on these two huge vehicles traveling at 17,000 miles per hour. We get contact and capture of the space station. The official exchange of Expedition 16 crew members Daniel Tani and Leopold Ehart was completed that evening when they exchanged their Soyuz custom-made seat liners 
and Tanny became a member of the STS-122 crew, while Ehart began his position as flight engineer for Expedition 16. And you can see after a couple of days of being trapped on the small confines of the space shuttle, we're happy to have a lot of extra room to move around in, but also a bit clumsy as well. It takes a few days to figure out how to move around in such a large volume. But we were happy to see Dan and uh, happy to have him become part of our crew and really happy to have the chance to bring him home. And then on the uh, first night we had on the space station, uh, Peggy and her crew were uh, nice enough to invite us over to the service module to have dinner over there and they brought out the best Russian food they had and it was, uh, it was very good, very tasty. Gave us a chance to uh, relax a little bit and see our old friends and uh, have time off before we got into the work of getting to do some spacewalks. Here we're briefing the day before we go on our spacewalk and then you see here the day of the morning of the spacewalks we got our suits on and uh, Peggy and and Steve are getting us ready to go into the airlock and here's Stan getting uh, guided into the airlock very carefully then they close the hatch of the airlock and we can uh, get all the air out of there and then open the door and go outside and work. On February 12th, 2008, Walheim and Love conducted an EVA, completing the preparations for the unbirthing of Columbus from the payload bay. And with Melvin inside the space station working the robotic arm, the module was successfully lifted out of the payload bay and installed on the port side of Harmony. The next day, Walheim and Schlegel conducted the second EVA where they replaced a near-empty nitrogen tank assembly on the P-1 truss with a new full tank that was brought up in orbit by STS-122. The third EVA was conducted on February 15, 2008. Stan had attached the grapple fixture earlier, which allowed me to come down and grapple Columbus. This was our major mission objective, and we're going to, working with Dan Tani and uh, Leo Earhart's in the robotic workstation, we're able to move the Columbus module out of the payload bay. Now, this is sped up. It was really going very, very slowly, but we could look at monitors and look at the cameras and use that to maneuver this big module, this research laboratory, out of the bay and attach it to the space station. We're now moving it to the right of the shuttle, and we're configuring it. This is a view out of the aft window the guys were looking at as we were installing it. And now we're reconfiguring the arm to allow it to line up perfectly so we can pull it in to node two. So that's a lot of reconfiguration. And now here we go. We're going into the... Uh, no two to berth it. A little more motion, we're getting there. Beautiful views of the ground as we go by. One little more snug, and we're there. Columbus installed. Once it's installed, we have inside, of course, also outfitting activities to do. And uh, once we are in the lab, uh, we have to remove a lot of launch locks. We see here Dan and, uh, and Leo to install the panel and uh, Steve here to work on a handrail, or better say, footrail. Uh, myself working now at an experiment level, uh, removing launch locks of Biolabor. And uh, one of the favorite uh, also pastimes, uh, semi-pastime activity is taking pictures, and I don't need to comment that. It's a Caribbean, it's, uh, it's just breathtaking. On February 17th, the crews conducted a farewell ceremony and closed the hatches between the two ships. The next day, Atlantis undocked from the station. The guys on the ground did a great job in preserving enough propellant and consumables for us to be able to do a 360 degree fly around of the station for some photo documentation purposes. And it was a beautiful day and we got some great views of Columbus with both external payloads and all the equipment attached. Space Station uh, is just an absolutely incredible sight and it's very, very large. Uh, and it's just uh, breathtaking to see it flying uh, with the Earth in the background. And there's a view of Dan leaving his home in space and headed back to the house. After a few days in orbit, Atlantis performed its deorbit burn and returned to runway 15 at the Kennedy Space Center on February 20th, 2008. 
that bring the shuttle speed down to a reasonable 200 knots for landing. This is a view out the overhead windows. What you're seeing there, that pulsing flame, is our several hundred mile long plasma trail that comes out behind the shuttle as we're entering the atmosphere and bleeding off all that speed. Okay, so with those uh, twin sonic booms that they always hear at the Kennedy Space Center when Orbiter was coming home, uh, we we're headed back. The weather was beautiful at Florida, just a high cloud deck here, which you'll see will pop through this cloud deck. And uh, as soon as we come out of it, the runway will be right there in front of us, right where it's supposed to be. Uh, it was, uh, Dex and I had done these kind of approaches between the two of us a couple thousand times, and it was great to see that the orbiter flew just like our, uh, our practiced uh, vehicles. Uh, Dex was talking me down through this uh, the whole time, telling me where I was, where I needed to go, and the orbiter was flying great. Uh, if you're looking in the pilot's view on the left, uh, we, it was nice to know that our families were right there on the left side of the runway watching us as we went by, and uh, they said they could see us in the windows as we were coming into land. Coming into touchdown on runway 15 at the Kennedy Space Center, uh, this was a, a great relief uh, right about now. We knew we had it down safely, just a few more procedures to do, get the drag chute out, get it slowed down and stopped uh, on center line, hopefully eventually. On March 9th, 2008, a new European cargo vehicle, the Automated Transfer Vehicle, was launched atop an Ariane 5 launch vehicle from ESA launch site in French Guiana for a mission to resupply the International Space Station. sky over Kourou here, always an impressive sight. 775 tons lifting off. The DDO is saying that everything is okay on board. Alex has just come rushing in. You look very pleased of what you've seen. How was it out there? Uh, that was absolutely terrific. It was a marvelous show. The light and sound were absolutely impressive. What impressed you most? Uh, I think the, 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 the sound, but it comes a little bit later, but the sound is really impressive. It's not the first time you've seen a launch. No, it's not the first time, but each time it's a little bit like the first time. All right, sound, sounds exciting. I'll go out next time. So we are now uh, in flight. So from now on, we shall leave the green panel and follow the launcher's health status on this little graphic that you can see. The automated transfer vehicle was designed as an expendable cargo spacecraft. Each vehicle consisted of two sections, the system bus and an integrated cargo carrier. The system bus contained the ATV's propulsion system, avionics bays, and solar arrays. It was principally used following the vehicle's detachment from the Ariane 5 to automatically transverse the remaining distance and dock with the ISS. The integrated cargo carrier consisted of a pressurized module, external bays for fluid and gas cargoes, further avionics and rendezvous sensors, and ultimately the docking mechanism. The primary structure of the ATV is protected by a meteorite and debris protection system, and it weighs 20.7 tons at launch and has a cargo capacity of 8 tons. The docking system of the ATV consists of a pair of videometers and a pair of telegonometers manufactured by Sodern, a subsidiary of Airbus. In terms of its role, the ATV was designed to complement the smaller Russian Progress spacecraft, possessing three times its useful payload capacity. Similar to the Progress, it would carry both bulk liquids and relatively fragile freight which would be stored within a cargo hold maintained at pressurized t-shirt sleeve environment in order that astronauts would be able to access payloads without the need to put on spacesuits. 
the ATV, like the Progress, also serves as the container for the station's waste. The pressurized cargo section of the ATV was based on the Italian-built multi-purpose logistics module, but unlike the MPLM, the ATV used the same docking mechanism as employed on the Progress. On December 9, 1998, the ESA awarded a $470 million contract to proceed with development work on the ATV to French aerospace company Aerospatiale. At the point at which the contract had been awarded, it was envisioned that the first flight of the ATV would be conducted during September of 2003. However, after years of delays and complications, it wasn't until July 31, 2007 that the first ATV, Jules Verne, arrived at the ESA spaceport in Kourou, French Guiana, after a nearly two-week journey from Rotterdam Harbor, and was mated with the Airane 5 for launch. The spacecraft separated from its carrier rocket one hour and six minutes and 41 seconds after liftoff, and navigation systems were subsequently activated. Two days later, on March 11th, the four main engines of the ATV were fired for the first time, marking the beginning of several orbital insertion boosts. Because the Jules Verne was the first ATV, ESA performed several on-orbit demonstration tests in order to confirm that it was able to safely approach and dock with the ISS. After launch, the ATV spent nearly three weeks in free flight. It successfully underwent collision avoidance maneuver tests on March 13th and March 14th, ensuring that the collision avoidance maneuver could be conducted as a last back-off mechanism should all other systems fail during the docking maneuver. Subsequently, the ATV performed two docking demonstration tests called Demo Days. These tests consisted of a series of rendezvous with the ISS and culminated in its final test, the April 3rd, 2008 automatic docking with the ISS proving the capabilities of the ESA's first fully automated expendable cargo resupply spacecraft. The ATV paved the way for other supply craft to visit the station as the space shuttle neared retirement. 